Welcome to Love and Rage from Extinction Rebellion, New York City. My name is Susan, and today I'm grateful for Genevieve Gunther from End Climate Silence for taking the time to talk with us about Extinction Rebellion's first demand, tell the truth. Hey, Genevieve. Hi, Susan. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Tell us a little bit about how you ended up in this world of language and climate science. Well, I am trained as an English professor. I got my PhD in Renaissance literature from Berkeley, and my first book was about Renaissance aesthetics in poetry and drama. But after I became a mom, I started getting increasingly alarmed about the future I would give my son after I was dead. And I started to do more research into climate change, and I decided that I had a kind of moral responsibility to devote my freedom and my labor to trying to contribute whatever I could to solving this problem. So I took some courses in climate science. I did Al Gore's climate reality training at one point, but I became radicalized when the New York Times in 2017 hired Brett Stevens for their opinion page because I was deeply, deeply shocked that the paper of record, which I assumed was an ally in sort of my political consciousness, thought that climate denial was a legitimate political opinion. So I actually um, started a petition to try to get Stevens fired. And this petition, which ended up getting 40,000 signatures, did not, in fact, get the New York Times to rescind their offer to Stevens. But it did connect me to other activists in the community and to climate scientists, and it got me on Twitter. And in so doing, it sort of gave me a way to see into this movement and see how I could contribute to it. And I realized, especially after Stevens um, wrote his first column called A Climate of Complete Certainty, that I could bring my expertise in how language signifies and how people use language to propaganda effects in order to help clarify the project of climate communication and sort of move you know, American politics forward, I hope. So yeah. words really matter. Words make a difference. I think they do. Yeah. So, you know, I love the fact that Extinction Rebellion has a lot of people that are not necessarily climate scientists who are so passionate and, and involved. And you don't I, I know you took some courses in climate science, but you don't necessarily have to be a scientist to understand this issue. Why doesn't the media tell the truth? So the news media has a paradigm for objectivity, which um, has completely failed to uh, meet the climate crisis head on. Instead of telling the truth, what they do is they present two contrary opinions. This is false balance. They present two contrary opinions and step back and sort of allow the reader to draw his or her own conclusions about the opinions that they're representing. But what they've done in the context of climate change is they've represented climate science on one side, and then they've brought climate denial in on the other side as a kind of contrary opinion, as if science itself were a political opinion and not a practice that attempted to make objective statements about the world. This has been exacerbated by the climate deniers' strategy of politicizing climate science as if climate science were a political position. So this kind of echo chamber has created this approach to climate change where um, climate denial has been presented as the kind of balance to climate science. That's sort of the background of this. And that's definitely gotten better. But the problem is that now that climate change has become a sort of polarizing issue because of this decades long campaign of organized climate denial, the media still feels paralyzed and feels incapable of telling the truth about it because it, they worry that it makes them look biased. In addition, of course, they have their own embedded interests because most of media outlets except The Guardian in the UK are still receiving funding from the fossil fuel industry. And even though there is a kind of gap between or a line between coverage and business. There is a way in which their business model is about representing business as usual and not contesting the very paradigm under which we're living our lives, which is what climate change requires us to do. I do think, however, that the print news media has done an extremely good job of starting to bring climate change into the stories they're telling about its causes and effects. 
Some outlets have not only increased the number of reporters they have writing about climate change as a topic, they've also started to mention climate change in their stories about extreme weather, in their stories about energy, in their stories about geopolitics, in their stories about immigration, helping readers understand that climate change really does affect all of these things that we're seeing in our daily lives all the time. Unfortunately, the broadcast news media, particularly the network news, is doing an absolutely abysmal job of bringing climate change into their coverage. They never mention climate change when they're reporting on extreme weather, and they almost always fail to mention when new studies come out in climate science, when events like the warmest January on record are announced. Even just a few weeks ago, when Jeff Bezos, the billionaire that we all know and loathe, announced that he was going to dedicate $10 billion to a new climate solutions fund. You would think that this would be something that the broadcast news would be interested in covering, because usually they cover the, the behavior of billionaires with a kind of like slavish attention. But in fact, nobody even mentioned it except for David Muir on ABC. So right now, the broadcast news media has a kind of blanket silence where climate change is concerned, and that's what End Climate Silence is focusing on, mostly because most voters who vote consistently get a great deal of their news from broadcast news. And even though concern and alarm about climate change is rising among American voters, it's not anywhere close to what it needs to be. And it's because people are uninformed, because their dominant news source uh, isn't mentioning climate change and not bringing it into their coverage about climate change stories that are actually already happening. Right. So what you're saying is most people are not reading the New York Times. They're either listening to the radio or they're watching cable TV, let's say CNN, MSNBC. So they're not really getting deep stories to begin with. They're getting superficial. And there's, you know, I always wonder, is there money involved? Is there another reason why these stories are not getting out there. Is this a conflict of interest with corporate funders? Have well, you looked into that? I don't know that corporate funders have directly told television news executives that they can't discuss climate change. I honestly don't think that it works that way. Okay. I think that the model that allows TV stations to promise corporate funders that they're bringing viewers in perpetuates climate silence, but in a kind of more indirect way. So the TV news in particular thinks of itself as an entertainment business. They do not think of themselves as a journalistic business, even though they have dedicated producers and editors who do think of themselves as journalists, but the executives think of themselves as being in the entertainment business. And they think of themselves as delivering viewers to corporate sponsors. Overall, they're going to consistently make the decision not to do stories that are going to decrease viewership. And historically, at least, viewers have turned off the television when climate stories come on, in part because they're, they've been represented as, you know, things that are kind of depoliticized in certain ways as, you know, a science story about nature. So not something that's important for you to know about because it's not really going to affect you in your daily life. And in part, of course, because climate change is just terrifying and overwhelming and seems absolutely insurmountable if you don't understand that you have political power in a collective. People have turned off the television. The answer to your question is no, but also yes, because the model that they're offering corporate sponsors makes it less likely that they're going to run climate stories. But this is why And Climate Silence came up with the paradigm that we did, that we now are trying to sell to producers and editors and even TV news executives which is you don't actually have to do more stories about climate change. You don't actually have to ask your viewers to keep the TV on or off. You just have to mention climate change in the stories that you are already telling about its causes and effects. Every time there's a hurricane, during the fires in Australia, every time there's a kind of extreme weather event, 
they give their viewers blanket coverage of this, right? Because it is actually, as they say, good TV, right? There are visuals, it's exciting, it's dramatic. So while you're delivering that quote unquote good TV about human suffering, you just connect the dots to climate change. Two sentences, three sentences, right? Which show that climate change is almost always exacerbating these events in some way. And then you mentioned that these events are gonna to continue to get worse until we stop using fossil fuels. What you've done there is you've delivered the news that you're already delivering, but you bring climate change into it and not for some sort of politically instrumental reason, but because you actually have a journalistic and a moral responsibility to tell the truth about what's happening in the world so that your viewers can be informed, but you can do it in a way that's not gonna disturb this overall model of the television news as a form of entertainment. The other issue that I discovered is that there's something less nefarious and more practical going on, which is that television news producers are under kind of strict orders to write the television news in about third or fourth grade language. And it's been very difficult to get any climate scientists to be able to allow people to talk about climate change in that kind of simplistic way. Because for them, in order for them to say something accurate, they have to qualify it. They have to contextualize it. They have to present it in this very sort of disciplinary, sophisticated way. And so this has also been the sort of barrier to the television news taking on climate change. The fact that other people are starting to talk about climate change and taking on that responsibility for communicating it to the media and communicating it to the public opens up opportunities for the TV news to receive sort of communications instructions or think about communication models in a new way. So, you know, I think Extinction Rebellion has really excelled in that piece. I agree. Because the heading for Extinction and what to do about it talk mm -hmm. is it's a talk about the science and of course the social science, but the way we deliver that science, I feel is really appropriate for a non-science audience mm -hmm. and in a way that makes you understand that this problem is really, really big. Yes. And, you know, I hear all the politicians using the big word. It's an existential threat. Mm -hmm. And I think we still need to water that down because that's definitely not a third grade word. <laughs> and so it's really important. It's one of the things XR has done well. We also, uh, last year, we targeted the New York Times for quite a while. And we still have up on the XR New York City website a list of media standards mm -hmm. um, for print media. And uh, maybe we could work with you and with and climate silence to create something similar for that broadcast media and somehow put some more pressure on them to find a way to take this elephant that's in the room and, and address it. I do think that Extinction Rebellion has done an incredible job of really conveying what a phrase like this is an existential threat really means. It means that if we don't stop using fossil fuels and transition our economy away from fossil fuels, millions of people are going to die, right? That's what an existential threat means. Climate change, our fossil fuel economy is going to kill millions and millions of people. I think that it's very important that we talk about climate change in those terms because I'm sorry, there is no one on this planet, including me, <laughs> who's going to give up the benefits of the fossil fuel economy, right? Unless we understand that if we don't, we're going to die. So that to me is the sort of fundamental core issue of climate change politics. And I feel like really XR is probably doing the best job of conveying that stark reality of sort of any activist group that I really know. Yeah. So I hear that you're working on a book. Can you tell us a little bit about this? <laughs> yes, I'm working on a book about the role of language in the politics of climate change. And the genesis of this book was Brett Stevens' inaugural column for the New York Times called Climate of Complete Certainty, which was this really sophisticated rendering of the 
organized denialist argument that the climate science is too quote unquote uncertain to justify spending, you know, trillions of dollars to decarbonize our global economy. So when Stevens wrote that book, I had just taken some courses in climate science. So I knew that the way that scientists were defining uncertainty was very different from the way that sort of regular folks like you and me understand the meaning of that word. Sometimes scientists use the word uncertainty to mean not knowing, but really they use it as a synonym for confidence. You can talk about the uncertainty interval of the model projections, or you can talk about the confidence interval of the model projections. Uncertainty really means range of projected outcomes, all of which you can predict with confidence, but you don't know where on that range we're gonna end up. But when you and I hear the word uncertainty, we think that means not really knowing. So what I think happened over the past 30 or 40 years is that scientists afraid to be called political or alarmist were extra scrupulous to talk about the uncertainty of their research to really show that they weren't making predictions, they were actually laying out an uncertainty range. But every time that they emphasized this in an attempt to be accurate, in an attempt to be depoliticized, they actually reinforced the denialist message that they weren't really sure whether climate change was real. And so to me, I felt like this whole political story of how language was exploited for propaganda effects by the denialist industry really sort of microscoped down into this word uncertainty. And then all of a sudden I started hearing other words that seemed to have this kind of political, what's the word I'm looking for? This kind of political story in them. Risk, or right now um, cost is a big one, or alarmist is another big one, or innovation, or resilience even. All of these words are actually sort of circulating in the social field and being exploited by climate deniers to nefarious ends. So I came up with this idea for a book project which looked at each of these words individually and through the story of these words, you see how not only climate deniers are using language to try to block climate action as one of their techniques for doing so, but also how you know the language that even advocates use sometimes work against seeing the reality of this problem and desiring the solutions. Even a you know, completely seemingly neutral word like we, for example, like we are responsible for climate change, really hides how the fossil fuel industry and their political partners knew that fossil fuels were creating climate change, but did everything they could to lie to the rest of us so that we would be so embedded in this fossil fuel economy that it would be almost impossible to extricate ourselves. You are not responsible for climate change in that way, and neither are you and neither am I. Yet, if you say we cause climate change, you obscure that differentiated responsibility under this kind of weirdly universal pronoun. Even in words like human or nature or, you know, truth even, do that kind of work. So the book is about not only the language that climate deniers use, but the language that we all use and how it obscures the truth about climate change and biases us against the solutions. And then the third part of the book is a re um, imagined vocabulary based on emotional, psychological, spiritual words like love and grief and courage that we all need to sort of revive and use to allow us to join the climate movement and sustain us through our activism, because that's really what's going to save us. You know, I think Extinction Rebellion has done really a good job with the kung fu of language. Mm -hmm. I mean, I no longer use the term climate change. Mm -hmm. I go out of my way and say climate and ecological emergency. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we do do, which is another elephant in the room, is that grief piece. Because grief is really the price we pay for love. Mm -hmm. 100%. And in our culture, we, of course... We all want to be happy all the time, but addressing that grief, I think, is something that XR is unique among all the green groups that I've ever been involved in, in um, really working to address that. 
and some of it through the work of Joanna Macy. And I completely agree that these words really, really matter. So the way I found out about you, Genevieve, was on Twitter. And for those of you who might not be on social media or on Twitter, there's a climate Twitter community out there that is fascinating because it's real scientists. Can you tell me about your life in the uh, Twitterverse? Well, the reason I got on Twitter to begin with was when I started this petition to try to get Brett Stevens fired. It was the week, I think it was the week before the March for Science and the Climate March in DC. So I actually went to these marches by myself with a stack of handouts and handed out flyers about the petition to college climate groups and asked them to share it in their networks. And just doing that, I think I got almost 18 or almost 20,000 signatures. And so the organizer from change.org uh, or the campaign, the climate campaign director from change.org called me up and said, OK, this petition is getting a ton of play. I think it can really go far, but you need to get onto Twitter. And I was like, what is Twitter? You know, because I was a Shakespeare scholar and I didn't really do social media. And I just thought all of that was just sort of I was a Luddite. She said, no, no, you need to get on Twitter to put, promote the petition on Twitter and to alert climate journalists to this petition. And I said, OK, fine. I got onto Twitter to promote the petition. But in the process of doing that, I sort of got to know other activists in the climate space. I got to know who the journalists were and I got to know the scientists and I realized that you know, people who are working on climate change in each of these registers are all talking to each other on Twitter. And politicians who have made climate their priority, and of course the ones who haven't, are also talking to each other on Twitter. And academic researchers in the energy space and in political science are there. And it's a whole conversation that's happening and a whole debate that's happening. And very often what happens on Twitter actually does move media discourse in one direction or another and moves politics forward. Now, you know, mostly I'm writing, working on my book. So, you know, I'll write for a few hours and then I'll get up and take a break and then I'll spend, you know, 15 minutes on Twitter and then I'll go back. But over the course of the day, you really learn a ton from these incredibly smart and incredibly dedicated people. And it's helped me clarify my thinking on a bunch of issues. And of course, end climate silence uses Twitter as our platform for digital activism because all of the journalists and all of the producers are on Twitter. They're all worried about what their colleagues and their readers and viewers think of them on Twitter. And so if they're not doing a good enough job and they haven't responded to us, if we've reached out to them behind the scenes, we call them out on Twitter. And I think doing so has been ex enormously effective. I don't know that using Twitter for political ends in any other realm than media would be quite as effective, but this really is where the media conversation is happening. So if you're doing activism on the media, I think Twitter has just been a godsend. I will agree with you. I always learn so much from the scientists that are on there. Um, you know, like uh, Dr. Robert Howarth from Cornell. There's a couple of guests. Sandra Steingraber is on there. Um, I love her. And I notice you have a new person on your board of and climate silence and climate silence, who's a West Coast professor, Peter Kalmus. Kalmus. Yeah. So yeah, and he's written a book about climate for for the average average person. What do you recommend for um, our listeners who are either new to Extinction Rebellion or you know serious rebels? What do you suggest to them for getting more involved in this issue about making the media tell the truth? Well, I know that there are going to be continued XR media actions. I would say join those. And then honestly, <laughs> if I may, I'd say follow End Climate Silence on Twitter and please retweet our tweets. And then also, if you see stories which should have mentioned climate change, you can tweet them to us at our Twitter. And you can always call out journalists and 
TV news producers yourself. The more noise we make, the less they'll be able to ignore us. So retweet us, call them out yourself, send us stories, and just never let up. Really have no shame and never let up. And it sounds like you have a practice in which you, you allocate, let's say, 15-minute blocks and you go and you do that. Retweeting really helps to amplify exactly. the message. And so that's that's great. So what's your Twitter handle besides End Climate Silence? If we yes. can follow you as well. Oh, yes. Please follow me as well. Sure. I'd love to see you all on Twitter. I'm Dr. Vive which is, you know, the word doctor and then Vive is V-I-V-E. Short for Genevieve. Short for Genevieve. Genevieve. Exactly. Okay. Great. Anything else you want to tell the rebels out there in Extinction Rebellion? Well, thank you for joining the movement. You are needed. I'm with you. And have courage and have faith because, you know, systemic change, how it happens, it happens really slowly, almost imperceptibly. And then all at once, all at once. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Genevieve, for coming and speaking with us today. Once again, this has been Love and Rage from Extinction Rebellion NYC. And we'll see you in the Twitter sphere and we'll see you in the streets. This podcast has been a production of Extinction Rebellion New York City. We have no advertisers. We are volunteers fueled by love and rage. If you would like more information about Extinction Rebellion, please go to xrebellion.nyc. That website address is in the show notes for this episode. Thanks for listening, and see you in the streets.